Welcome to the Podcast Coins. I'm your host, Patrick McLean, and I'll be joined by a panel of experts. Hi, my name is Melton Demiris. Whitfield Diffie. So my name is Bill Barheit. Sitting here today with Dan Hell. My name is Lou Kerner. Happy to be here with Dave Jevons. Here today with Roger Baer. And on this episode, we will be discussing the battle over online privacy. A hot button topic today that has long been fought by a mostly unknown ally, the cypherpunk movement and how this laid the groundwork for cryptocurrency. Now imagine a modern day band of punk rock Robin Hoods riding in to save the day by stealing some of the government's monetary power and returning it to the people. The economic advantage Bitcoin has is the nerve to ask the difficult question that our frumpy high school economics teacher never had the courage to ask. What is money, and how does it work? It's in the answer to these questions that we gain insight into some of the most important economic and financial hurdles we face in today's world while trying to remain a free and open society. It's inevitable that an economic revolution is coming, and that war will be fought on a digital battlefield where all of our weapons and assets are stored in a virtual reality in some invisible cloud online and the digital battlefield calls for digital warriors. In the case of Bitcoin, it's one thing to rely on a punk rock Robin Hood who promises to ensure the security of economic principles against the three-headed dragon of big tech, government, and crony thug bankers. But it's quite another thing to slay that dragon. What we need is a different kind of hero. Someone who can slay that dragon and ensure the privacy of our money as it lives in the digital age and return that power to we, the people, so that we're free to realize our full economic potential in private and as we wish. For this mission, we need a hacker vigilante, a different kind of digital warrior, a different kind of punk. What we need is a cypherpunk. So let's unpack that a bit for people who might not know what a cypherpunk is, right? Yeah. And, and we live in a bubble. So, like, in the most basic terms, if you were to describe it to a, your grandmother, how, what would you describe a cypherpunk as? A technology person who cares about privacy on a global basis, but is also thinking about political awareness and freedom, and freedom of, how, how, freedom of money and how it applies to the entire social fabric and how the internet will relate to it. So it's really early freedom fighters for internet privacy before anyone knew that was a problem. It's really a manifesto that uh, technology and privacy are going to be important, the internet's going to be big, and we need to have privacy controls, not just on you know, the web and our traffic and email at the time was very important, but also payments. So it's really a manifesto around combination of what was happening and I think, honestly, if you ask me, the punk movement and how that moved forward in the world and politics and encryption and a vision for the future. And that's what that was. And it really, I think, begot a massive movement, if you will, on virtual currencies, cryptocurrencies, you know, the eCash protocols, DigiCash, all of these other things. eGold kind of sprung out either from that movement or were associated with it and people came together around that mailing list and then associated things and conferences. And can you talk a bit about um, kind of that core group at the time of like cypherpunk meetups? I think uh, somewhere here in San Francisco. And do you yeah. mind talking about some of those key players? San Francisco was the hotbed of the cypherpunk culture. Uh, they would even print out code on t-shirts because that code was considered to be free speech. And at the time, the U.S. Department of Defense and the intelligence agencies, they had banned encryption from being used because they were worried that it would uh, allow for too much freedom. And they, would, they actually considered it a weapon at the time. So these cypherpunks were a pretty rebellious group. I mean, they're geeks, but they were rebellious geeks. And so they printed all of that, they printed their code on their shirts and they walked around with it as like an open declaration of F you, you know, like <laughs> I'm gonna, this is a freedom of speech issue. So the San Francisco culture at the time is very permissive, very open-minded. So the cypherpunks found root here and they also exchange ideas. You know, they all build on top of each other and learn from each other in terms of code, game theory, how to apply cryptography to different things. Let's go back to your, your earliest days as a cypherpunk and, and, and in that movement. Could you detail us a little bit about 
what led you to these ideals, what got you involved in, in the cryptographic and cypherpunk community, and, and a little bit of that earlier history. Sure, so I was a cryptographer for the CIA in the late 80s, uh, working on secure messaging systems, which meant something very different because public key cryptography was not part of the discourse at that level of application in those days, meaning the technology that we, had to, we have today in a web browser was not available back then. But there were myriad online forums happening at the time where the groundwork was being laid for kind of the internet of the future. What did personal privacy mean to us at the time, for example? What would it mean in a world where everyone was connected to a network? And a lot of people, smarter than me with a lot of foresight, were very active in that community. And I was just drawn to it. Like I was enamored with all of the ideals of the cypherpunk community. The manifesto, when I first read it, really resonated with me. And the ideals of agency and personal privacy online uh, I've always resonated with me ever since I, I was first exposed to that movement, even before there was a commercial internet. Now, these may not be household names per se, but you know, who were the sort of people that were involved in that space in the early days? Who were the critical people that were, were surrounding that ideology, that movement, both at governmental and, and private levels? Yeah, there were so many people. I mean, God, um, Hal Finney, uh, Nick May, uh, uh, you know, uh, Diffie. Whitfield Diffie. You were born on June 5th, 1944, which is, I realize today, is a day before D-Day. And, and a lot of people would claim that the decryption of communications was actually more powerful than, than the nuclear bomb uh, in, in that act. Do you see any symbolism there? Or like, well, I have astrological a, so or not? Lots of people believe in astrology, mm -hmm. right? The theory that the stars control your life. I have a, so I, I believe in something called terrestrology, that is terrestrial events control your life. And I think it must be significant that I was born almost exactly at the moment that the first signals intelligence deception started against the Germans as part of the D-Day invasion. And do you view that as, was that the first example of cryptography oh, gosh, affecting no. the world? No, of course not. Modern cryptography, so to speak, and by which I mean the elements of AEA, advanced encryption standard are in it, dates either from Baghdad around 800 current era or 1500 in, around in, in Italy. And so it took until about 20th century. You have two things happen. One is the demand. Suddenly you have radio. Radio is just incredible, but it bypasses all the security measures known in the 19th century, except for cryptography. And the other one is good machining. So you begin to have electric, you know, mechanical device, you can mass produce mechanical devices that work reliably. And so that's what made possible the cryptographic machines that come into play in the, in the 20s and 30s and, and are the backbone of secure communications in World War II. Do you mind kind of giving me your thoughts around the community that you've seen driven from, from cryptography and, and cypherpunks? Uh, I don't know if you use that term. Well, I mean, cypherpunks just sort of came to my attention circa 1990. I don't know exactly when, but I began getting their mailings. And at that time, there were, there were occasional in-person meetings, uh, I, which I missed the first one which apparently was very good. It was at the second one, maybe a third one. But cypherpunk seemed to me were about, largely about anonymity. Anonymous remailers were a big thing with them. They were about a general thesis that wasn't far from my original vision of things, which is, uh, retrospect, clearly a sort of a techie view, is that you put your technical abilities into, into, into what you do for freedom. And so, I mean, there's this line, cypherpunks write code. We're going to get this stuff done by, by programming it ourselves. We have seen the rapid erosion of trust in institutions. People don't trust their governments. People don't trust academia. People don't trust the institutions that for the last hundred years have governed our society, right? Have sort of told us what to think and what to believe and the proliferation and availability of information 
on the internet, right? The rapid dissemination of that information. If we look at WikiLeaks and Edward Snowden and what he revealed to the American public and the nature of dissent in our world, um, this tenuous grasp on power that institutions have had through their monopoly on information and their monopoly on money is being eroded, not just by Bitcoin, but by all of these different forces in the realm of technology that are forcing us to rethink what trust actually looks like. So many people played different roles, right? Um, even today, like when you, when you think about WikiLeaks and the history there and its roots traced back to uh, the cypherpunk movement or, um, you know, the early testers of Bitcoin. I mentioned, you know, like with, with Hal Finney, traced back to the early cypherpunk movement. They were heroes to me. Like I worshiped those people because they didn't care what other people thought about them or uh, what it might do to them personally or, or being ostracized for basically not being part of the system. They believed what they believed. They believed it was better for mankind if you had agency over yourself on, the, on whatever would become the internet because we really didn't know at the time. And if it wasn't for them and the work they did, we wouldn't have an internet that worked the way it works today. They're simply the unsung heroes of, of the modern information age, as far as I'm concerned. Do you think people associate that term cypherpunk or people wanting privacy with doing illicit or secret things? Sure. Yeah, got it. And there were those people. Right, right, right. But do you think that's a stigma that like, is applied to it, that people, it's scary when they hear it? Remember what VHS was used for in the early days? And what? Well, pornography in the early, early days at some point, right? Or ripping off TV. And then it you know, came into video and DVDs and Netflix and it's mass streaming and it's Amazon Prime and everything grew out of it. And I think the same thing is here, which was the cypherpunk movement was visionary, very visionary. And yeah, sure, there was always people who would sit together and say, you know, we could enable a $4 billion criminal money laundering thing. I mean, that's real, that happened. Those conversations happened, but it wasn't what it was about. It was really about fundamental issues of privacy versus secrecy, anonymity, but also how it applies broadly to the internet, not just payments. So it was looking at website traffic, email traffic, freedom of speech. All of those things I think have been empowered by the internet, presaged Tor, for example, which has been important for journalistic freedom. So it, it, yeah, there might be some stigma behind it, but I mean, you've also got to think about how many people know about it even these days? You know, 10,000 people, it's not like there's a 10 million people who think cyberpunk's bad. <laughs> They're a bunch of geeks who really love encryption but they were very radical in how they thought about applying that encryption. They felt encryption was an inherent human right to freedom of speech, freedom of money. And so freedom of speech had already occurred. Public private key cryptography underpins everything that we do. Messaging on some of your apps that you use, Signal, WhatsApp, etc. cetera. Uh, the, the secure messaging you go when you go to a website and you see the little lock button, that means that there's the encryption being used to secure the messaging and to secure your browsing behavior. Uh, when you see, um, when you go log into your bank, all of this is encrypted. Encryption rules the world around us. And so these cypherpunks were the early ones to see this vision and how cryptography would change everything. In the most simple terms, can you explain, I guess, either cryptography and what, what you did in the advances of public key cryptography? Okay. Well, cryptography is the process of encoding messages or stored data or anything in such a way that they're only usable and readable by people who know secrets. And for a millennium or so, how, however far you, know, you want to trace these things, it, the, the notion was, well, we're exchanging secret messages. What distinguishes everybody else in the world from us is, well, we know the same secret. So once we've agreed on the secret, right, then we can exchange messages with it. So it's really very much like an amplifier. The, the secret's kind of small, a few hundred characters at most, or it can be, can be that small, can be larger. But the messages, you know, these days it could be terabytes. And so the paradigm of this, this 
amplification process was that we knew the same secret key. And that doesn't scale very well. If you have a, a lot of people involved, then you need a very elaborate mechanism for arranging keys. People can't all get together and agree about keys. What we realized was that you can relax that requirement in such a way that you can break the secrets up actually into a secret piece and a public piece. And then each of us can tell the other the public piece and that allows us to negotiate a common secret that nobody else knows. The beauty in the 1970s when Diffie and Hellman published their first paper on the distribution of these keys changed everything because it basically was a system which says, hey, you can shout your public key from the rooftop and it doesn't matter because you want everyone to have it. Your private key is always going to remain private and we've worked it out such that that private key is impossible to guess without maybe a trillion years of computing time, right? And, and so that breakthrough now enables our, our smartphones, our PCs, our, our television set-top boxes, our, our watches to all communicate in a way where we don't have to trust any third party in the middle to distribute those keys anymore. We can do it ourselves. And that just, it just changes everything and has for almost 40 years now. It seemed like cryptography existed at some point, and then what you worked on was the ability to not only uh, encode something, but share it with someone that you didn't know. Is that a good summary? Yeah, it's not bad. I mean, it's indeed the fact that we have secure communications as part of commerce among the billions of people who use the internet today. Uh, is something that is made possible by having a freer key management mechanism than was available before the work that was done in the 70s. The brilliance of that cannot be understated. Now, of course, that begs the question, well, how hard is it to figure out or even guess my private key? And that's the real significance of this technology is, is that mathematically speaking, with today's technology, it is impossible if the key is long enough, because the key is a series of ones and zeros, if the key is long enough, it's impossible, right, to guess my private key, which is why we have encrypted information. When we use our favorite messaging app, we have encrypted credit card processing. We have Bitcoin uh, and a whole bunch of other technologies that rely on this, you know, public private key based cryptography. What was beautiful about public key cryptography was I could generate my own identity, if you will, and you could generate yours mathematically. It's just math. And it used very large numbers and very large computation to do it so that I knew that it was almost impossible for you to fake it out that you were someone else. So you could guarantee within one one trillionth of a percentage that it's you and it's me and I could send you my public key over email, put it on a website, but the person who controls that private key, which would be me, cannot be faked. So I can publish effectively this anonymous identity all over the world, which means you can communicate with me securely, and you know it's me communicating with you, but you can't steal my identity. That came to be what's called a digital signature. And curiously, it now seems to be the more important phenomenon. It seems to many, many people, the more important phenomenon. Because fundamentally what's going on in internet commerce is that you, you need signatures over distances uh, to authenticate transactions. So I have a document, it comes into my hands, I do something to construct its signature, and nobody else knows how to do that. But uh, lots of other people know how to verify, oh yeah, that's Diffie's signature on this document. So that was the first step. And the point is this asymmetry. One person can do something, the other person can recognize it. To make it even more tangible for anyone listening, it, it, this is, you can send a message and no one can read it. Correct. This is, you can have an identity and no one, or you could visit a website, and people can't, Correct. What, right? So it's, and do you mind extrapolating on that a bit? Like what, what were actually, what did people actually want? Yeah, so the, the days when it really got started, it was things about like, I want to be able to have anonymous email. 
So I want to send messages to people and not have it tracked and not have people know the contents of the message, so encryption. And I think that was valid, you know? Like, I want to communicate with people and I don't need the world seeing it. I don't need my ISP seeing it or other ISPs and why do they need to know what I'm sending to whom? Because if you look at it in the real world, the post office doesn't open your mail. It was the same concept, very basic, very simple. But it expanded into, okay, website traffic. Why do websites need to know who I am unless I want them to? What about payments and transactions? Why do I need them to know who I am and my bank account unless I want them to? So it grew from that. But it was really started in those very simple roots of let's make email more secure, more private, and if we want to disclose it, fine. And then web traffic, same thing. But really the early things presaged all of the payment stuff too. It was like, well, we need payment mechanisms over the internet, which are not centralized, where we can do private payments to people that we want all around the world. And we don't have to have our financial information spewing all over the place. And that was really a lot of in the early days, it was about that too. I got to see firsthand how early internet technologies were being deployed. A lot of mistakes that were being made. People processing credit card transactions online where their information was effectively sent in free text for everyone to see because people didn't know what encryption was. They didn't know what the S in HTTPS meant and that one connection was secure and one connection was insecure. And so as somebody who was deeply passionate about that ideal, having come you know, up through that, that movement, the moment that I was given the opportunity to work on anything related to that, I jumped on it. And so I ended up spending a lot of time on how do you do uh, you know, private key infrastructure for websites that are first basically trying to launch? How do you accept a credit card on the internet in a, in a manner that's secure, that's not putting your personal information at risk? No one had ever thought about these ideas before. Well, no one commercially had ever thought about them before. Researchers had been thinking about these ideals for years, which is why we ended up with public private key cryptography in the first place. And, and just to touch one last point on that, just to give a bit of context as to uh, perhaps why that was such a game changer from a governmental, that sort of public private cryptography war uh, sort of battle that went on uh, throughout the 20th century. The history of encryption globally is a fascinating topic in and of itself. In the United States, we have this idea of weapons grade cryptography. What that means is, is that certain types of cryptographic systems cannot be exported outside the United States uh, because they're effectively embargoed from exports because they're considered weapons. This was a problem, for example, in the Netscape days. We had two versions of the Netscape browser, one that you could use inside the United States and one that had a weaker key that we were allowed to export because it didn't violate the U.S. export rules around encryption. Now, anybody today who listens to that has to shake their head and say, this is pure insanity. The Department of Defense was threatening to put people in jail for treason and terrorism for writing code because they had felt that encryption was a weapon and they were actually going to slap people with a weapons export, um, you know, penalties and fines and, and jail time for that. For math. For math. Right. These guys would joke around and they'd print off the code on t-shirts and be like, what are you going to do, take me to jail for, for code? And code is free speech. Why was the government during this time period so worried, do you think, to, to let people, worried about, and to the point that it's becoming a mockery, right, that people are printing on t-shirts? Well, I think that it was a legacy from the 1940s, from the World War II era, which was, as you point out, interception of messages and intelligence was important. And this begot the intelligence community of the 50s and the 60s that we saw. So, you know, the invention of the NSA and what eventually became the CIA and these other agencies in the United States, but of course, every other country had it too. GCHQ and others in the UK, every big country had that type of thing. So. Spying on people's communications was important for understanding troop movements, etc. And it was how you won wars. It was one of the ways. Force matters too, right? Peace through superior firepower, as they used to say. But that turned into kind of a methodology and a mindset for people, which was what we've always done for the last 20, 30, 40 years is what we're going to do now. And so they grew up in the 80s and 90s and into the, really in the 2000s of we need to spy on people's communications, therefore people should not have private communications, and oh, we can prove that somebody did something bad once or 10 times, and if we could have only spied on everyone, we might have theoretically in some world been able to stop it or done something about it or 
what have you. So I view it as just a legacy of thinking about communications interception. And so when it became widespread and available and you could print it on a t-shirt, which was largely uncrackable at the time, and probably mostly is still today, it just shook the world up and the people in power didn't know what to do. We had had a long history of cypherpunks, right? Sure. So Hashcash and um, Digigold and Eagold, all of these prior iterations of internet native money had mm -hmm. existed. And I really think you have to go back to 1992, right, to the original cypherpunk mailing list and the cypherpunk manifesto that was published. If you recall, in the 90s, the first crypto wars were fought. And it was a battle between governments and their desire to control every aspect of the lives of their citizens, and technologists who wanted to use encryption, right, and particularly encryption in communications, to give people privacy. Because throughout human history, every revolution has been launched by people who are pseudonymous. Mm -hmm. The framers of the US Constitution published the Bill of Rights under a pseudonym, Publius. Shakespeare published their work under a pseudonym, right? The ability for people to have privacy has been fundamental th to human development throughout history. It's been fundamental to catalyzing revolutions, right? It's ideas that are extremely powerful, and then the implementation of those ideas requires people to have certain inalienable, inalienable pardon freedoms. And so I think really if we look at Bitcoin, it's a monetary expression of what the cypherpunks envisioned right. when they talked about ensuring people had the, the ability to utilize tools in the form of open source code that would help ensure liberty and freedom of speech. Data as a form of currency. Could you help break that down for a lay person who perhaps doesn't understand how, how that really works? Sure, so in, in our daily lives, um, you know, we create a lot of data. You know, when we go on the internet and we go from internet site to internet site, obviously when we're on Facebook and you know, we're, you know, Facebook knows whose different you know, pages we're going and reading, what different articles uh, that we're reading. So you know, Facebook probably more than any other company in the world knows more about people and what they like. And, and when they know that, then they can serve you ads that you're probably gonna like more. So the more the world knows about you, the more valuable you are to the world. Um, and you know you create a, a data from everything you do, from all the email you send. You know why does Google give you free email, right? There's that famous saying: if you're not paying for the product, you are the product, right? And 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 you're the product by the data that you're creating. And you know the 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 problem is is you know we've seen lots of ways in which this data can be used in in, in ways in which you'd be unhappy about. You know, and, and, and when you think about data, you know, data is everything that can essentially be turned into a zero and one, uh, including your own DNA. And so the fact that 23andMe is out there selling your own DNA um, should be really concerning to anybody who has given their DNA to 23andMe. And so all the data about you should be owned by you. That data privacy is, uh, is a human right. And so you know, what we're about is creating an ecosystem, not one that we control, but decentralized ecosystem uh, where people can uh, own and monetize their data if they want to or not. Do you think people have a right to privacy? Oh, yes, well, of course, if you put it that loosely, of course I do. Um, that doesn't mean that they're going to have the opportunity. It seems to me that uh, basically privacy has very little chance against improving communications. So if you look at a you know, group of events, uh, what was driving a truck 50 years ago, maybe even 25, was a very independent job. Your boss said, get this load you know, from Boston to, to Chicago in three days. You could do whatever, you know, drive fast enough, you can have a day to do something else, haul another load along the side, or, some, some side route or something like that. And today, of course, they're, they're tracked everywhere with GPS. And they're, so they're, they have much less privacy than they used to. But it seems now that you know, individual devices are capable of you know, running full encryption, let's say the iPhone, saying that they don't want to give access to the government and, and certain you know, politicians or lawmakers going to these corporations and basically saying, give us a back door. Oh, no question. Those, you know, Yes, that's a big part of the current landscape. And where do you see that conversation heading? 
Like, how do you think, if you imagine, how do you think? Well, I think, I, I think there's no chance of our having secure private conversations unless something can be done that takes it out of the hands of large players like Apple, who can be coerced by the government. Now, when the cypherpunk movement was happening, you have to remember that there was a serious government push coming to make private communications illegal, particularly driven out of the United States. So they wanted to make uh, all cryptography software sanctioned, basically, meaning you couldn't export crypto software outside of the United States. And they wanted to put back doors in crypto software, like the Clipper chip, for example, which was any thing that does crypto, we're gonna be able to backdoor it. And so that was what was happening right at that time in the mid to late 90s was the government was basically saying all crypto should be effectively controlled by the government. And I think the secondary thing was the government can't control their own information, so we're gonna trust them with all of our stuff with some backdoor key. And we all know 20 years later, that's obviously been proven to be true. And so that was also part of the dynamic, was thinking about what is government control around speech, free speech, personal speech, personal payments, but also just that whole background of they were trying to clamp down on things that wouldn't ever work. So I guess in, in today's world, like what is standard cryptography, public key cryptography, do you believe that uh, state-sponsored actors or governments already have the ability to break it and, and we just don't know? Well, I think clearly in some cases, yes, and I presume in some cases, no. So there's a, a thing for which I forget the code name, but it was believed after Snowden that NSA had a special engine for attacking, I think it's thousand bit Diffie Hellman, which was in use in a variety of networks. And so, you know, that's the sense and it's the same mistake that the Germans made with Enigma. Germans knew Enigma could be broken. They had a pretty good estimate of how much work it would take, and they didn't understand that somebody would actually do that much work. So similarly, I think you would find mistakes being made today, and people would, would say, you know, the cost of breaking this is, is too big for anybody, and they, they turn out to be mistaken. Somebody reasons, oh, well, there's enough of this in use that if we fund an attack on it, then we can get enough product out of it uh, to be worthwhile. We have a lot of things that were taken for granted in the formulation of current law, not just in the US, but in the French Revolution, uh, in similar events in, in Britain over a period of time, that just take for granted what was true physically at that time. Probably the single most important Right? is there is no protection in the U.S. Constitution against you having your mind read forcibly. If somebody knew how to do it, the worst would happen is there'd be a, a warrant requirement for it. I remember one of the key projects was this, um, this project uh, you know, where this guy had created this, this new type of money. And, um, and it was interesting, and, and a lot of people were being drawn to it, that this guy had... This was, I think it was like 96 or 97, he had created a, a money for the internet, right? And um, this is interesting, how, how can you have money for the internet? I mean, I don't think the government would, would allow that, right? And, and so, you know, ultimately the, the, the project failed, but it was the first time that anybody who had roots to the cypherpunk community had ever launched something publicly that claimed to be a, a better money. Now it was dollars, right? So, you know, many of us in the Bitcoin community now would call anything that's a digital dollar putting lipstick on a pig because you can still print a, an infinite amount of them, but, um, but it was digital and you could theory hold it. The problem, of course, was that you had to trust his company. Now, now of course, we know the company was DigiCash and this DigiCash project ultimately failed because you had to trust his company. Right. So the holy grail of money, even in those days, was how could you recreate DigiCash without DigiCash? Right. And ultimately, of course, we know that you could do it. We thought you couldn't, by the way, to be clear. Many of us thought it was impossible. But now we know that you could create DigiCash or can create DigiCash without DigiCash. And the way you do it is Bitcoin. Um, and, I'll, and I'll set the stage a little bit. Right. So we have uh, the new seed. We have the, the DNA species of Bitcoin. We have the season in which we're gonna plant it. 
Uh, now we need to choose the method in which we're going to plant it, or Satoshi needs to choose. Um, in this portion, you talk about him distributing it through the cypherpunks. Uh, do you mind kind of giving a bit of background there, and then we can get into depth? Yeah, so with any new idea, you have to find a soil receptive to it. You know, if you have a new idea and you, you proclaim it to the world and no one cares, that idea fades away. With Bitcoin, Satoshi needed to make sure that the, the right group found it first for them to help it, for, for it to grab root and start to grow. That group was the cypherpunks. Encryption rules the world around us, and so these cypherpunks were the early ones to see this vision and how cryptography would change everything. So we saw it changing everything with, for freedom of speech at first. And then they hypothesized that we would see it go into money. And Satoshi was the first one to create a cryptocurrency. That's where the word crypto comes from, is cryptography. Cryptocurrency that was crafted to work and crafted that would be lasting. Cryptocurrency is the best tool second to the internet that the world has ever seen to enable that. So we had the internet before, which allowed people to communicate with each other remotely. Now we have cryptocurrencies where people can do payments remotely with people all over the world and they don't need permission from anybody. That's literally one of the most important inventions in all of human history. Right there on par with the internet, electricity and the wheel. That's how big a deal the invention of Bitcoin was. In my career, I, I always worked in extremely uh, privacy-oriented projects in my free time. And I, I've always been an, an advocate of, of privacy and freedom of people. So um, the fact that uh, Bitcoin was offering a possibility of, uh, to people to keep control of their own wealth was one of the most exciting parts of, uh, of, of uh, learning um, how it was working. I believe that uh, it is important uh, the, the more, you know, the, uh, it is important for people to keep control of their own wealth. I believe people should um, be entitled to keep their wealth private, they should be entitled to keep their wealth secure, and they should be entitled to use and spend their own wealth in the way they want without uh, and an oppressive control from the governments. Do you find anything appealing in the decentralization of things like Bitcoin where they can't call a CEO? Oh, I, feel, I, find, I find something appealing in the decentralization of everything. Tell me, what is a cypherpunk to you? It's really a manifesto that uh, technology and privacy are going to be important, the internet's going to be big, and we need to have privacy controls, not just on you know, the web and our traffic and email at the time was very important, but also payments and politics and encryption and a vision for the future. And that's what that was. And it really, I think, begot a massive movement, if you will, on virtual currencies, cryptocurrencies. Now that the stage is set and we know what is at stake in this battle over our privacy and our financial freedom, in the next episode, we will discuss the birth of a new player, Bitcoin. I'm Patrick McLean, and this is the Podcast Coins.